you're happy to see you all today. I've had to condense two lectures into one because I simply don't have the time to give an extra lecture uh, because I'm leaving, I'm leaving Hong Kong to go to Shanghai. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've basically put together two lectures into one lecture for today. So that means we have a lot of material to cover. But actually, going over it, I realize it actually makes quite good sense to do them together. Because I had divided these two lectures into the two types of Chinese poetry, shi and si. So instead of dividing them, I put them together. Now let me start off by, by giving you the general message of what I have to say today. Because, you know, I think there always has to be a message, right? Um, and um, my message is this. Translating Chinese poetry is very, very difficult. And I'm not very good at it. I specialize in translating Chinese fiction, you know, xiao shuo. And then recently I've been translating um, early Chinese thought in the form of Sun Tzu Ding Fa, Yi Jing, Dao Zhe Jing, that kind of thing. I have tried to translate poetry, but it's very hard for me. I have to work very, very hard because I'm not a poet. I am a storyteller. Everybody tells me I'm just a storyteller. I'm, I'm a completely um, superficial uh, storyteller, raconteur, they call it. But I am at least a storyteller. And um, when it comes to poetry, I'm very aware of my own shortcomings. But I do love poetry. And I think what we have to remember today is, is to enjoy the poems, you know. I've given you quite a few poems to look at. And Chinese poetry is really one of the wonders of the world, you know. It is quite extraordinary. And it's very, very hard to translate. Now, I think the main message I want to get across today is that for too long, people have been saying that the translation of Chinese poetry was the invention of Ezra Pound and the modernists, you know. The, 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 the modernists, and this, this was, a, first of all, this was said by T.S. Eliot, who was a very famous modernist poet. And he made the statement that, t that Ezra Pound, who was another great poet, invented Chinese poetry for our time. And that, that statement makes me very angry, actually, because it's, completely no it's complete nonsense. And unfortunately, modernism has been so fashionable for so long that this statement has, has, has continued to be repeated again and again and again. And it's completely untrue. And I think what we have to realize is that each, each generation, each, each period in history has to translate again for itself. And to say that Ezra Pound invented Chinese poetry is just absolutely untrue. And my main focus today at the beginning is to explain to you that really the very first translations of Chinese poetry, and in some respects the best, were actually done in the middle of the 19th century during the middle of the Romantic period. Now, I need to say a little bit about Romanticism. Now, I need to get my PowerPoint organized, so I'm not very... What's that? Hmm. Is that... So I've been watching a TV series about Versailles. Everyone's killing everybody else. I'm thinking someone's trying to kill me with some sort of long-range weapon. Okay, let's see what we've got here on the PowerPoint. Um, oh, yes. Now, what I'm talking about is some translations from the Chinese done by a lady named Judith Gautier. And she was the daughter of a very famous French poet called Théophile Gautier. And there he is. There's Théophile Gautier, and there's his daughter, and that's his wife. He married a very glamorous Italian um, lady, and um, he had a very beautiful daughter called Judith. Now, let's see what else we've got here, because I'm slightly, um, um, I need to go back a bit. Okay, and this, if you came to my first lecture, I talked quite a bit about chinoiserie. Chinoiserie was a fashion in the 18th century. And, and during the period of Chinoiserie, there was quite a lot of interest in China and Chinese um, ideas. But there really wasn't any proper translation of Chinese poetry. They were only interested in the Shi Jing in, in terms of what information it could give them about ancient China. They were not really um, interested in translating it as poetry. They did translate it, but they translated it into Latin without any regard for the poetic beauty of the original. 
and I talked about that two weeks ago. And um, Srinivasarī was that period. And um, a bit later, in the 19th century, Europe went into a completely different period, which we normally refer to as the Romantic Era. And in England, we had famous poets, such as Keats and Shelley and Wordsworth and Byron. And, and they were the, rom the great Romantics, you know, and wonderful poets they were too. Now, in France, there was equally a Romantic movement in music, painting, and literature. And it was during this Romantic movement, and in fact, it was at the height of this Romantic movement, that the most extraordinary thing happened to Chinese poetry. And that's what I want to start off by telling you about today. Um, and it was, all, it was all to do with this man, Théophile Gautier. He was one of the absolute top French poets of the Romantic period. He knew all the Romantic artists, musicians, and so on. And um, he wrote a poem, in fact, called Chimoserie. And that poem, I'll read to the French, because it's good to read French, it's a lovely language. Celle que j'aime à présent est en Chine. Elle demeure avec ses vieux parents dans une tour de porcelaine fine au fleuve jaune où sont les cormorants. And um, he wrote this poem which means, it's, it's on your hand up, but I'll translate it for you. Anyway. It means, the, the woman I love, actually, she's in China. So, in fact, he was projecting his image of the, of the beautiful Chinese woman. This is the romantic idea of the ideal feminine beauty. She's Chinese, you see, and she lives with her old parents. You know. He somehow got the idea that all Chinese women live with their old parents, which, of course, isn't always true. She lives in a beautiful porcelain tower by the, by the Yellow River where the cormorants are. So this was his poem. This has nothing to do with his daughter. He just wrote a, a rather um, imaginative poem about a beautiful Chinese lady who he imagined living in China. And um, later on, he um, collaborated... Well, no, later on, some poems of, of Gautier were set to music by Hector Berlioz. He was the great romantic French composer. And you've just been listening. When you came in, you've been listening to a wonderful poem of, of Gautier, set to music by Berlioz. It was called, um, it's from his s series called Nuit d'été, and it's called Le Spectre de la Rose. Um, this is a typical romantic French po painting by Eugène Delacroix of Ophelia, the lady in Hamlet. And um, I just give you that as an example of the romantic movement in painting. Um, and the, this poem, The Spectre of the Rose, which you just heard, is the most beautiful poem. It's, it's, a, it's a lady imagining, very romantic poem, imagining that she is the ghost of a flower worn by her lover at the previous night's ball. And um, it was such a popular poem, it was eventually turned into a ballet. I see, there's the rose. I mean, this is just a modern um, photograph. And there was a, a famous ballet based on this, with the famous um, Russian um, uh, 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 ba ba ballet dancer, Nijinsky, playing, playing in, this, in this famous ballet. And this, these are the words of the, of the poem. Now, um, later on, Théophile Gautier's daughter, Judith, who is very beautiful, um, as a teenager, I think she was a little bit bored at home, and her dad, who was very fond of her, tried to think of ways to amuse her. But first of all, let's talk about the lady. She was extremely beautiful, and a famous American painter called John Singer Sargent um, was visiting Paris. He had an eye for beautiful women, and he painted lots of pictures of Judith Gautier. So I'd like to introduce you to Judith Gautier, seen through the eyes of John Singer Sargent the American painter. So here she is. He painted her many, many times. I think it was just an excuse to, be, to spend time with her, you see. He liked young ladies. And here, there's one of his paintings of her, wearing rather a beautiful t dress. And um, there's another one, not a very good reproduction, I'm afraid. He was always painting her. And there's a, very, there's a sketch of, of the young Judith Gautier. And here's, this is a uh, very early photograph of her. 
And this is the, this is the last of my pictures by Sergeant of Judith Gauthier. And he obviously really liked her. Judith Gauthier went on to become the lover of almost every single member of the French Romantic movement, including the famous Victor Hugo. And um, Richard Wagner was her lover at one point. You know, French ladies, they're very, very enterprising, shall we put it that way. And she had a lot of them. Um, and then she finally married another French writer called Catuil Mondez. And um, this, is, this is how she looked later in life. But um, what's interesting to me, and for this purpose, for, for today, is that when she was a young lady, probably aged about 17 or 18, her father introduced her to a young Chinese, a man called Ding Dunling, who happened to be in Paris. He was, he was stranded because he'd come with someone who died, a bishop, and he had nothing to do. So Théophile Gautier <coughs> said to his daughter, would you like to learn Chinese, my dear? I found a rather nice young Chinese man. Why doesn't he come and, and be your tutor? So Monsieur Ding Dongling moved in and taught Judith Gautier all about Chinese. And he told her lots of Chinese poems, including poems by Li Bo and, um, and Li Qing Zhao and Du Fu and so on. And he helped her to translate them into French. And of course, Judith Gautier being the daughter of a very great poet, I mean, Théophile Gautier was one of the absolute number one poets in 19th century France. She, she absorbed a lot of this poetic um, inheritance from her father. And um, she sat down together with Monsieur Ding Dong Ling, and she put together a little book of translate, not that little actually, about 250 pages of translations into French from, um, from Monsieur Ding Dong Ling's memory. He was basically doing it all from memory, because he didn't have any books. And actually, he, he included some poems by himself, and even some poems by the, the Chinese, um, you know, some contemporary Chinese. And it was, a, it was a funny collection. But the point is, she made a wonderful job. This is her handwriting. And this is, this is the cover of the book. It was called Le Livre, Le Livre de Jade, which means the, the Book of Jade. The Book of Jade was the title she gave to this collection. And um, it was reprinted many, many times. It became very, very popular. And it was translated into German, into English, and, and became almost really like a bestseller, you know. So for T.S. Eliot to say that Ezra Pound invented Chinese is just absolute rubbish. And it's time somebody stood up and said so, you know. Actually, if anyone invented Chinese poetry for Europe, it was Mademoiselle Judith Gautier, you know. And um, she, um, she did a very good job of it. And I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Um, let's see what we've got here. Now, why isn't this working? Oh, yeah. And this, this is from a later edition of the Livre de Jade, beautifully illustrated. Um, this came out quite a few years later. But look at the beautiful illustrations. And here's another one, you see. This is actually a poem by Li Qingzhao. So, I mean, this was going around in like 1860, you know, about 50 years before Ezra Pound even heard of anything Chinese. And it was translated into English. More than once, actually, this is a translation. You see, Chinese lyrics from the Book of Jade by James Whittle. And this came out in about 1890, I think. Um, and um, so, so really, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is, in fact, Judith Gautier's um, Livre de Jade. And now I'm going to ask you to turn to your handout. I hope you've all got a handout, because there's an awful lot of material in the handout, and I shall have to read. Re I, have, I didn't bring my reading glasses, unfortunately. But um, if you look on page three of the handout, please have a look. I've given some examples from Gautier's Le Livre de Jade, and um, she, for example, she. The first example I've given you, she she gives all the poems titles, and this one she calls Pour oublier ses pensées to forget one's thoughts. And, and the, her poem goes like this. Réjouissons-nous ensemble et remplissons de vient tièdes nos tasses de porcelaine. Let's be happy together and fill our, fill our cups with warm wine, our porcelain cups. Le frais printemps s'éloigne, mais il reviendra. The 
Spring is about to go, but it will come back. Vivons tant que nos lèvres auront soif. Let's drink as much as our lips are thirsty. Let's drink. Et peut-être oublierons-nous, and perhaps we will forget, que nous sommes à l'hiver de notre âge, that we are at the winter of our age, and that the flowers fade, et que les fleurs se fanent. Now, it's very hard to find what the poem was that she was translating, because I think sometimes Ding Dong Ling, you know, he was sitting back there and being given tea and so on, and he just made stuff up, you know. But someone reckons it's based on this poem which I've given you, which is, nobody knows who wrote it. Starts up, Ru Ru Ren Kong Lao, Nian Nian Chun Gang Hui, Chun Gang Wei Gui, Xiang Huan Zai Zun Jiu, Bu Yong Xi Hua Fei. And this is a poem which is supposed to be by Wang Wei, but probably not by Wang Wei. And as you can see, her translation is very free, but it's a very beautiful piece of French. And it contains the basic, um, the basic feeling of the poem, which is that as age, age is something we cannot stop. I can tell you that right now, you know. It, you don't, there's no way you can turn back the clock, you know. It moves on relentlessly. So you might as well have a glass of wine and forget all about it. I'm, unfortunately, I've just come out of hospital. I'm not allowed to have a glass of wine. Otherwise, I'd have several. Um, but you see, this is, this is a spirit which you find in many, many Chinese poems, you know. Throughout the, his, throughout the history of China, this idea that, you know, Life is just a fleeting thing, you know. Let's, let's have a glass of wine and maybe sing, you know. And, um, and then there's the second example I've given you is from a well-known poem by Li, Li Bo, um, which is simply entitled, it's on page four. The poem's in simply entitled Sung Yo Ren, Qing Shan Hung Bei Guo. You, I'm sure you all know that poem. And um, she translates it um, as follows. Um, par la verte montagne, au rue de chemin, je vous reconduis jusqu'à l'enceinte du nord. By the green mountain, um, on the rough roads, I, I accompany you to the northern um, border of the town, you see. So far, it's quite close to the Chinese. L'eau écumante roule autour des murs et se perd vers l'Orient. C'est à cet endroit que nous nous séparons. And so on. This is her, her translation of this very famous poem by Li Bo. Um, and then I've given you another translation by Ezra Pound, just for reference. But my main, my main um, purpose here is to show you that Judith Gautier did a lot of stuff, you know. She was, a, she was no fool. She wasn't just a silly teenage girl. She took this very seriously. And she probably had her father breathing down her neck the whole time because he was, he was very fond of his daughter. And his daughter had spent a lot of her youth away from him because of the mother and so on. And, um, and then he found this project to bring his daughter together with a Chinese, a young Chinese man. And um, she really put her heart and soul into it. And then the next one is um, another famous poem by Li Bo. Chun Ye Luo Cheng Wen Di. Hearing a flute on a spring night outside Luoyang. And... Um, I've given you her translation, you see. Un jour, par-dessus le feuillage et les fleurs embaumées, le vent m'apporta le son d'une flûte lointaine. Alors j'ai coupé une branche de sol et j'ai répondu une chanson. Depuis la nuit, lorsque tout dort, les oiseaux entendent une conversation dans leur langage. It's a very beautiful poem in French. I mean, it's part of the French romantic movement. She was... She was fitting into that movement effortlessly because her father was a great romantic poet and there she was for the first time ever a, a, a gifted European poet sitting down absorbing some French poems and producing absorbing some Chinese poems and producing French poems to match them I've given you I've given you some other translations into English but I also want to draw your attention to the second one which is by a man called Fletcher because he also has been forgotten by the so-called modernists. You know. Now, Fletcher was a British consul working in China. I think he worked in um, uh, Beihai, opposite um, Hainan, and he translated a lot of Chinese poetry into English verse. And his, his translation of this poem, I think, is very attractive. Let me read it to you. 
And he puts, he puts as the title, Soft Stillness and the Night Become the Touches of Sweet Harmony. Now that is a quotation from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. So you can tell immediately this is a man who loves poetry, who is writing from a deep love and knowledge of poetry. And this is how he translates that famous poem by Libo. From what clear flute unseen these flying trills with which the wind of spring the city fills. Amid the strains the flower is plucked anew in what sweet garden how my bosom thrills. Now, it's not great poetry, but it's very pleasant. And of course it rhymes. Now, Ezra Pound um, was very rude about Fletcher because he was a modernist. He wanted to throw off the entire, the entire legacy of romantic poetry. But um, Fletcher was an un unashamed um, Victorian poet. He would have read people like Alfred Lord Tennyson or Swinburne, those kind of late 19th century poets. And he produces a poem which is really not a bad effort, which rhymes and which reproduces the basic idea of the, of the Chinese poem. Now, I'm going to move on now from Judith Gautier to another example of why the, the modernists are so completely wrong in their assertion. And uh, let me see if I've got the right picture here. Oh, yes. By the way, this is, the, this is a great French scholar translator called the Marquis d'Hervé de Saint-Denis. He translated a great deal of Tang poetry, but rather academic. So I'm not going to... Um, spend a lot of time talking about him. But you know, again, what nonsense to say that Ezra Pound invented Chinese poetry. This man published you know, a huge anthology of about 200 Tang poems with commentary, with translation, and so on, in about the year 1870. So you know, he, he was m years before Ezra Pound. And he was a very interesting man. But well, I won't talk about him right now. I want, that's Ezra Pound, you see. He was such an arrogant little man. And he had to, <laughs> He really was. I mean, he really was a very, a very difficult, bad-tempered, extremely gifted, brilliant young man. But he got some crazy ideas. And we talked about him two weeks ago with, with regards to the Shi Jing, you know. Um, and um, he got a lot of his material for his first book from an American called Ernest Fenelosa. And, and, and Pound produced this book called Café in, in, um, in 1915. But you know, as I've been saying, there's been a lot of stuff before him. Um, and this is, this is T.S. Eliot, who was a great friend of Ezra Pound's. And um, you know, you know T.S. Eliot's most famous poem, The Wasteland, which everybody has to know, you know, which has been translated into Chinese about four or five times, was largely rewritten by Ezra Pound. You know, and T.S. Eliot admitted that. He sent Ezra Pound the rough draft and Ezra Pound was the one who really knocked it into shape because he was, a, he was what Pound called Il Milio Fabro, the better craftsman. He was a very fine poet. There's no question about that. Ezra Pound was a better poet than T.S. Eliot. These were the modernists, right? The great modernists. Um, now, these are some of the other translators I'm, I'm, I've given you here, so I'm going to move over them quite quickly. Now, we come to the next stage in our journey because Judith Gautier's um, translation, Le Livre de Jade, was famously translated into German by a man called Hans Betke, rather good-looking man, and um, he produced a book called Die Chinesische Flöte, the Chinese flute. So now we've moved from the Book of Jade to the Chinese flute. Rather a lovely title, and there's a pretty young lady playing the flute, you see. And this came out in... Um, 1907. Now, round about that year, one of the greatest composers of the late Romantic period, um, Gustav Mahler, a really a giant of, of Western music, he composed the most extraordinary song cycle called Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth. Now, so Mahler, one of the greatest composers of all history in Europe, wrote what is perhaps his greatest masterpiece called Das Lied von der Erde. And that, this is a cycle of songs with accompaniment on it from the orchestra. And the songs are all set to words from Hans Betzger's Die Chinesische Flöte. 
So in other words, the, the words for this work originate with Judith Gauthier, because that's where Hans Becker got, got his stuff from. Hans Becker didn't know Chinese. So here we have another example where the pre-modernists are really the ones to look out for. They're the ones who brought Chinese poetry into Europe. Forget about Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot for a moment. They were, late, they were you know, they were just late, late comers. And um, this, the last movement of Das Lied von der Erde is called Der Abschied, which means the farewell. And again on pages um, five, five, mainly page five, I've given you the two Chinese poems on which this is based. One is a poem by the famous Meng Haoran, and the other is a poem by Wang Wei. And both of these poems were translated into German by Hans Bethke, and Mara put the two poems together and set the whole thing to music. And, um, and here's the bit I'm going to play to you. It's the very last section of this piece. And it, it goes like this. I won't read you the, the, the German because you're, you're, I don't see why you should have to read. It says, where am I going? I go, I wander in the mountains. I seek peace for my lonely heart. I wander homewards to my abode. I ne I'll never wander far. Still is my heart awaiting its hour. The dear earth everywhere blossoms in spring and grows green anew. Everywhere and forever, blue is the horizon. Forever, forever. Now, um, I've chosen... I, I, William, have they found the, the clip? Could you start playing it now? Uh, thank you very much. If you could start playing this clip. This is a very, very famous recording of this, move, of this piece of music. Oh, no, that's... that's but sung by the great Kathleen Ferrier, one of the greatest British contraltos, singers of, of the 20th century. And if we can just hear the song, she's, I'll put it back to the words. Here's the German, Wohin ich gehe? Where am I going? Ich gehe, I go. Ich wandere in die Berge. I wander in the mountains. Ich suche Ruhe. I seek rest. Für meine einsam Herz, for my lonely heart. Ich wandle nach der Heimat meiner Städte. Ich werde niemals in die Ferne schweifen. And so on. So if we can hear the music, rather than my voice, it is one of the most sublime pieces of music ever. So I, I, I seek your patience. This lady died very young. She died um, of cancer when she was at the height of her powers as a singer. But she continued to sing within, to within a few weeks of her death. And she was one of the great singers of, of our time, well, of my time, long before your time. And um, she made this recording back in about 1960, I think, so it's a very old recording. The reason why I'm playing you this music is because I think music is at the very heart of poetry. And I'm not the only person to think that, you know. The great French poet Verlaine said, of music above all things in poetry. They wanted, you know, if you don't have music in poetry, you, have, you don't have a poem at all. And the great, the great achievement of Judith Gauthier is that she made her, her French poems read like songs. You know, they have music. And if you don't have music in a translation of a poem, you might as well not bother, you know. A real poet sings, you know. It's a song. And, and even the most um, recent poetry, the good poems, they have music. They have music as their, their base. And, um, and when, when Mara set, this, set these poems to music, he knew what he was doing. The words are on page five in italics. Still is my heart.
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for being patient. And um, I really wanted you to hear that last ending of Dusty von der Erde because it's one of the great moments in Western music. And she's one of the greatest singers of all time. And um, my, 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 my reason for, for forcing this upon you is that I want you to understand how important music is as the under, uh, one of the underlying elements in poetry. But also I want you to understand how, as a result of Judith Gautier's wonderful mid-19th century romantic Livre de Jade and Hans Bethke's later Chinese Flute, these poems, these Chinese poems by Ma Haoran and Wang Wei found their way to the great composer Gustav Mahler and became the inspiration of his greatest work, in my opinion. And therefore they have reached the hearts of millions of, of listeners of music. Now, for me, that's far more important than the modernist translations of Chinese poetry, which have perhaps been read by a few thousand people. This is going right to the heart of the late romantic movement in European art and music. And therefore we should give credit to Judith Gautier, this young lady, you know, who spent time with Ding Dong Ling, you know, talking about poetry and, and had the, the courage to put down her translations. If anybody invented Chinese poetry for our time, it was Judith Gautier, not Ezra Pound. That is my answer to that pretentious man, T.S. Eliot, whose poetry I find so unpleasant to read. You know, that's my personal prejudice, you see. I'm, I'm actually an anti-modernist at heart. I'm basically an Edwardian, you know. I don't belong in the modern age at all. And um, I wanted to make that statement. Now, I want to go on now to look at some of the more modernist translators, in particular Arthur Whaley. Now, if you turn over to pages uh, six and seven of your handout, I've given you two examples of Arthur Whaley's <coughs> translations. One is, one is one of his early translations in which he translates a fool. You know, the fool is that wonderful prose poem or rhapsody. And uh, he translates a fool by Zhang Hong in which, in which a man encounters the bones of Zhuangzi lying on the roadside, and Zhuangzi speaks from the grave. And it's a wonderful fool. And Arthur Whaley translates it wonderfully into very old-fashioned kind of um, English verse. Not rhyming, but still, it has the rhythm of old-fashioned verse. The trouble was, Arthur Whaley decided after that, he would go against that whole idea, and decided to write modernistic translations where each Chinese word was represented by a stress in English. And after that, that's what he did all the time. It was like a formula. So I've given you another example from a poem by Bo Tu Yi called Mai Tan Wang, the, the old man who sells charcoal. And in the second example I've given you, which you can take home and read at your leisure, you see a typical Whaley modernistic translation where he turns the Chinese into a series of regular um, stresses. And this is the so-called invention of Chinese poetry by the modernists. Unfortunately, it doesn't, to me, represent Chinese poetry. Because as you all know, because you're all Chinese, Chinese poetry rhymes. It has a very strict form, you know, in, in, in terms of, this is a, this is a gu ti shi, so, so it just has regular numbers of characters, seven and then three, three, seven, seven. And it's very, very, Chinese poetry is not like Western poetry in that respect. It's always rhymes, always rhymes. It has strict rules about, you know, ping, ping, zi, zi, ping, zi, zi, ping, 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 or about the, 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 the so-called oblique tones and the level tones, you know. So Chinese poetry is a very different kettle of fish from Western poetry. But to try to turn it into modern, modernist um, poetry is a fundamental um, distortion, in my opinion, of the nature of Chinese poetry. When Li, when Li Bo was writing poetry, he wasn't a modernist at all. Nor was Bo Tu Yi, nor was anybody, actually, um, until we get to the 20th century. So I'd like you to look at those translations. And um, I also mention, in passing, um, various other so-called modernist translators. I'll just show you some 
some pictures of them. But this is one of them. A very formidable lady called Amy Lowell. She was um, one of the earliest um, outspoken feminist poets. And she was also a lesbian. And um, she was one of Ezra Pound's deadly enemies. He hated her. You see, these modernists, they spent all their time fighting each other, you know, like children. And um, Amy Lowell became very friendly with another lady called Florence Aisko, who lived in Shanghai, a very wealthy lady. Both of them very talented. And they, they, they produced a book together of translations called Fur Flower Tablets, uh, Sun Hua Jian, which, they, which came out in um, 1921. And they were the great rivals of Ezra Pound. And they were always being rude to each other. Ezra Pound was always saying rude things about them. They were always saying rude things about Ezra Pound because each side wanted to be the first to invent Chinese poetry, you see. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not, it's not like such a big deal. That's the thing. I quite enjoy looking at these things, but only as one of many. And then there was a very interesting American called Witter Bunner. Interesting enough, he was also one of the first outspokenly gay poets from California. And um, a very talented, um, rather less modernistic, rather less aggressive, quite a gentleman. And he met, he met a very interesting Chinese in San Francisco, a Chinese whose name was um, uh, Zhang Kenghu. And Zhang Kenghu was, was happened to be living in, in San Francisco. And he was actually a very remarkable man. He ended up being the Minister of Education in the government of Wang Jingwei in Nanjing when he went back to China. And he was quite a prominent public figure. He started off by being something of a left-wing anarchist, but his real love was Chinese poetry. And he and, he and Witter Binner got together and they produced this book called The Jade Mountain. You know, you've had Le Livre de Jade, the Book of Jade, you've had the Chinese flute, and now you've got the Jade Mountain. This is actually the whole of Tang Shi San Bai Shou translated into English. I actually rather like it. It's rather old-fashioned. It's not exactly um, modernistic. It's quite sort of um, 1920s, you know. And um, I often look at his translations with quite considerable pleasure. Um, and then a bit later on in America, in the 50s and 60s, you have a new generation of American poets who had a go at translating Chinese poetry. And the one of the most famous ones was a man called Kenneth Rexroff. And um, he, he became very friendly with a very talented young Chinese lady who also wrote poetry. Some of you may know her. She's actually a very good friend of mine. I invited her to come here today, but she can't make it because she's now in Taiwan. And her name was Zhong Ling. And she and Kenneth Rexroth were great friends. And they produced several books together, including... <coughs> Sorry, I'm having trouble with my voice. <coughs> including a very fine book of Li Ching Zhao's poems. So these are all... Um, but the great thing about Kenneth Rexroth is that he was a poet. You know, he was a very, very... In, he was a very um, spontaneous, inspired... He was one of the generation known as the Beats. And, um, and um, I, want to, I want you to look at an example on page 7. Because there's a, famous, there's a very famous poem by, by Wang Wei, um, which begins with the words, Kong Shan Bu Jian Ren, and um, it's been many times translated. And, um, and if you look at the translations I've given you, um, there's one at the very end, which is by, which is by Kenneth Rexroth. It's on the top of page 8. I think you better have Kenneth Rexroth looking at us, not jungling. And um, you see, if we just take the simplest example of a line from a Chinese poem, we just take the first line of that poem, Kong Shan Bu Jian Ren, right? and we, we translate it literally. Of course, we all know what it means literally. It means... Kong empty Shan mountain Bu no Jian Si Ren person, right? So empty mountain, no sea person, okay? Um, which sounds like a telegram, you know. It's a kind of thing, you, a tweet, you know. You could translate Chinese poems on Twitter, you know. Empty mountain, no sea person, you know. Um, 
<laughs> and so on and so forth. Of course, we all know that's ridiculous because that's not what the Chinese sounds like. Chinese is a monosyllabic language. And when you write Kung Shan Bu Jin, it just flows naturally. But if you say empty mountain, no sea person, it sounds like nonsense, you know. It sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Now, but everybody has a go at translating that word Kung, you know. And um, they, all, they all fail because they either say empty, or some of them even say lonely, or lone, or... And the thing is that what I'm trying to get to here is the idea of what I call spiritual resonance, or Shen Yun, right? In order to translate a word Kung, you have to understand the whole underground existence of that word. And in the case of Wang Wei, who, as we know, was a Buddhist, right? The word Kung means much more than just, you know, this is a glass, half empty, half full, you see. And if I drink it all, it'll be empty, right? But it has no spiritual meaning, right? It's just a glass, okay? However, for, for Wang Wei and for the whole of Chinese literature, the word Kung is deeply imbued with the meaning of Buddhist um, emptiness or void, you see. It's, it's a fundamental concept in the philosophy of Buddhism. That's why in Hong Lao Meng, for example, one of the wonderful monks is called Kong Kong Tao Ren, you know, Kong Kong Tao Ren. And David Hawkes calls him Vanitas, because in English, Vanitas, mean, vanity, means emptiness. Life Life is, a va is vanity. It doesn't mean you look at yourself in the mirror, oh, I'm so pretty. No, it doesn't mean that. It means it's empty. It has no, it has, it has no permanence. It's, 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 a, it's an impermanent void, you see. So the word kong, when, when you say kong shan, it means, it doesn't mean the mountain's empty. What the hell does empty mountain mean anyway? How could you have a full mountain, please? What would you fill it with? You know, wine, water, I don't know. It's almost meaningless to say empty mountain. And the point is that the, that the word empty has this deeply religious um, undertext, subtext. And the only person to get that right was Kenneth Wexler. And he translates that first line. It's on the very top of page um, 8. When he says, deep in the mountain wilderness. So he, he, he lets go of the Chinese completely. He departs from the Chinese. And he says, what's What's he trying to say about the mountain? Now, you see, Kenneth Rexroth is a great hiker. He likes to go hiking in the mountains. And when he goes hiking in the mountains, he has deep thoughts, you know. And when you say deep in the mountain wilderness, you could say, oh, where's the word wilderness in the Chinese? There isn't such a word. It just says Kong Shan Bu Jian. There's no, there's no mention of wilderness. But what is he doing by using the word wilderness? He's picking up on a Western religious echo. Where did, you know, where do the great ch Christian saints or hermits, where do they go to meditate on the meaning of life? They go out into the wilderness. They go into the desert. They, you know, they spend 40 days in the, in the wilderness. So by saying deep in the mountain wilderness, he's saying this mountain is a spiritual place. It's a place where I, where I come to understand the the void, where I come to understand that life is like this, you see. So when he says deep in the mountain wilderness, Kenneth Wexroth immediately shows himself to be not only a poet, but to be a deeply thinking poet. And um, I, I use that, oh, it's time for a break. Thank you so much. That's a very nice clock. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm deep in the mountain wilderness. I have no idea about time, you see. But thank you. Uh, we've almost reached a good stopping point here. In fact, we've reached a very good stopping point. So listen, I want to leave you. We'll come back after the break, and I'll look at mainly at the poetry. But the two points I have to make, really, to this, in this first half, one is that the modernists did not invent Chinese poetry for our time. If anybody did, it was Judith Gautier. And two, really to translate poetry, you have to be a poet. That's why Kenneth Wexroth succeeded where other people failed, because he had the poetic instinct. He had the sense of finding meaning that was poetic. And he created a poem out of Wang Wei's Kung Shan Bu Jian Ren, you know. So let's have a short break then. Okay, thank you. Before I move on to the, the, the second section, which is to do with the poetry, I want to draw your attention to the material I've given you on pages 8 and 9, because this is from David Hawkes's translation of Hong Lao Meng. And um, 
is this loud enough? You're hearing me clearly? Oh, you want to make some adjustments? Yes. Okay. That's better. Is that better? Thank you. Um, you see, David Hawkes did, he, he produced three books in his lifetime. The first one was the translation of the Chu Tzu. That was very early in his life. And he translated it into, into sort of more or less free verse without rhymes. And then he did a book about the poetry of Du Fu. And he decided that the poetry of Du Fu was really impossible to translate. So instead of translating it, he gave a very lengthy explanation. He could see, he could see, you know. And, um, and we, 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 we republished that in Hong Kong, actually, many years ago. And, um, and then he, he put at the end of each poem a kind of prose paraphrase. So not a translation. But then when he came to Hong Lamong, there was a lot of poetry in Hong Lamong. And he decided that he had to translate it all in rhyming verse. And um, it's, an, it's, an absolutely, it's, a, it's an incredible achievement. And I wanted to draw your attention to it. I've given you some examples here of how he, when, when, when the young people in, in the Da Guan Yuan started playing poetry games and so on and so forth, he made it all rhyme. And he went to great trouble to create rhyming translations. So he was a great, in a sense, he knew that the right way to do it was the traditional way, using rhyme. And on, on page um, nine, I've even reproduced a page from his notebooks where you can see him working very hard at, um, at trying to create rhymes. And I used, to see, I used to see him quite often. And he once told me that when he had trouble with finding rhymes from a poem, he would go into his garden and dig his, ve dig his vegetable plot, you know, and dig it. Because as, as he did physical work, he found the rhymes came more easily. That's his version of translation theory, you see. You, don't, you just have to go outside and do some, something active and maybe have a bath or have a glass of wine or something. And that's, um, that's, his, that's how he helped himself to rhyme. Because one of the people outside in, in the interval was asking me about how, you, you know, how, how, um, how difficult it is to make rhymes in English. And of course it's true. But some people are much better than others you know, at finding rhymes. And um, Hawkes was very good at finding rhymes. And he did a great deal of it in the Hong Lao Mung. Okay, so much for that. I want to move on now in the last part to looking at what is perhaps the most difficult of all Chinese poetic genre to translate, and that is Si poetry. And, and um, I've called this section on the bottom of page 9 Spirit Ditties of No Tone, which is actually um, a quotation from the English poet John Keats. Um, and... and the great irony with the poetry is it's, it's all written to music, but we don't have the music. That's why my great um, friend and um, mentor, Stephen Sung, Sung Chi, he published a book about the poetry, which he called Songs Without Music. Because they are songs, there is no music. We, know that we have virtually no recorded um, notations of the music for the poetry. One or two, but very, very, very few. And um, so I call this spirit ditties of no tone. And in, in a sense, if, if music is at the heart of poetry, with Su poetry, even more so. And how do we, how do we manage to um, create the silent music which is underlying the poetry of, of the Chinese Su? This is perhaps the greatest challenge in the whole repertoire of Chinese poetry. Now, on page 10, I've given you an example, which I often give students, of the only Tzu poem, or, or virtually the only Tzu poem that Arthur Whaley ever translated. And it's, it's part of a poem by Li Hoju, Li Yu, called, um, uh, well, well, it's to the tune Wang Jiangnan, and it begins with the words, Do Sha Hen, Zuo Ye Meng Hong Dun. And um, this is how Whaley translates it. Immeasurable pain. My dreaming soul last night was king again. As in past days, I wandered through the palace of delight. And in my dream, down grassy garden ways, glided my chariot smoother than a summer stream. 
There was moonlight. The trees were blossoming. And a faint wind softened the air of night. For it was spring. Now that is the most delightful old-fashioned English poem, which has meter, it has rhyme, it's very musical. Um, but actually, if you start to look at it very carefully, um, it, it takes enormous liberties with the Chinese. For, for a start, let me point out, um, in my dream down grassy garden ways. Well, I mean, um, I think we all know that Chinese gardens don't usually have any grass at all, actually. It's very much a Western garden idea to have a lawn. And um, he just invent, he just puts it in. And then, and then the famous line, Cha Ru Liu Shui, Ma Ru Long, he translates it, glided my chariot smoother than a summer stream. He thinks that his Cha, the, the, the emperor's chariot, was Ru Liu, was like a flowing stream, you see. Actually, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that in his dream in the palace, there were so many carriages. It was like a, a river of carriages. Uh, and there were so many ma, so many horses, because he was, he was dreaming of being the emperor again, you see. And then, and then the last line, which is a typical line from a Chinese poem, you know, Hua Yue Zheng Chun Feng. He, he turns it into four lines. There was moonlight, the trees were blossoming, and a faint wind softened the air of night, for it was spring. I mean, it's lovely, but it's, it's more like Judith Gautier than Ezra Pound. It's very much old-fashioned um, Edwardian poetry. And after that, pa uh, Arthur Whaley never did that again. You can see, literally, in the course of his life, he turned away from this kind of old-fashioned um, approach to translating, and he never translated another to the poem. Probably because he found them too easy, in a sense. He would have done the same thing again and again and again. And if you look at the next translation I've given you, and I've got a photograph of the man, let me try and find him. Oh yes, this gentleman, his name is Guo Chang Chang. I don't think he's alive anymore. He's a delightful man who lives in San Francisco, a Chinese-American, who... Um, I used to correspond with him when I worked here in Hong Kong at renditions. He was always sending me envelopes with lots of his translations. He was obviously a delightful old chap, and a bit of a hippie, actually, a bit of an old Chinese hippie living in San Francisco. And he got to know various American poets, and he produced lots of translations with them, which I really like. But you see, if you look at his translation, page 10, of this Duo Shafen, it's completely different from Arthur Whaley. And what, 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 what Mr. Mr. Guo, he called himself C.H. Kwok. You can see he's of Cantonese origin. He, he translates it, So many sorrows, and last night, in my dream, as if the old days were back, inspecting the imperial park. Chariots like a running stream, so many, the horses, curveting dragons, moon of flowers, in spring wind. Now, what's he doing here? Uh, he's doing something completely different from Arthur Whaley. But he's not doing an Ezra Pound. He's doing a sort of Californian beat, you know. He's, he's first of all using typography to break up the lines. So he, if you look at this, I've tried to reproduce the, the way he breaks the lines up. And, um, and he's sticking very closely to the Chinese but he's making it rather delightful. In fact, his translations are among my favorite modern translations of Chinese poetry because they're so spontaneous. He's just having a good time. And every time he does a book, he, he works together with another American beat, hippie sort of poet, and they're having a great time. Um, now, the second example I've given you of, of a Tzu poem and I've done this very often in classes, so any former students of mine who are here today, please forgive me, because you've seen this probably about 10 times before, but I think it's such a good example. This is a very famous Su poem by um, Jiang Jie, and uh, it's to the tune Yu Mei Ren, and it's entitled Ting Yu, and it's, um, it's a lovely poem. It's an absolutely typical Su poem. I, I like it very, very much. 
and it was translated some years ago by a friend of mine called John Scott. Now John Scott was a, he never, he never became famous, he never became successful, and he was a, unfortunately a man who liked to drink a lot. And he'd start drinking in the morning and he'd drink right through till midnight. He stayed with me a few times and he was a very hard person to have as a guest because he never stopped drinking and talking. But he was very, very gifted. And he translated this poem in a most extraordinary way. I'll read you his translation. Please follow the Chinese, which begins with Shao Nian Ting Yu, Go Lou Shan. The rain song I, in youth I heard from some bedroom, red candle setting behind a satin screen. Older and traveling, I heard rain in a boat, huge river, low clouds. Turn the page. A goose crying in the west wind parted from the flock. Now, when I hear rain in a hermit's cell, my hair has long turned grey. Sorrowness, happiness, parting, joining are all neutral raindrops all night long on the stone steps. Now, if you were a kind of professor of translation, you'd get this from a student and you'd say, oh my dear, you've made a terrible mistake in the first line. You translated, the rain song in youth I heard. But you seem to be translating yu ge as two words that go together, you see. Ting yu ge. But no, my dear student, I'm going to give you, you know, five out of ten because you've made a terrible mistake because actually the ge goes with lo, it's ge lo shang. And you ting yu, I heard the rain, zai yi ge ge lo. I was in a golo, you know, and I heard the rain pittering outside while I was sleeping with some beautiful lady, you see. But it doesn't mean the rain song. It's not that you go. But you see, what, what may seem to be a mistake is actually a stroke of genius on the part of John Scott. I don't think he was making a mistake. I think he was deliberately making a mistake. Because, you see, he actually calls the poem Rain Song. And he turns the whole poem into the song of the rain. The song of the rain, pitter patter, pitter patter, which reminds him that life is just a dream, you know. When he was a young man, he was sleeping in a girl and he heard the rain outside, you know. That was his memory of that. When he was a businessman traveling around by boat, he heard the rain outside the boat. And now he's an old man like me, and he hears the rain outside his, outside his window, and he, he thinks about it differently again. So each time he heard the rain, he thought differently. And then, and then it, the stroke of genius comes at the end when he says, um, raindrops all night long, all neutral. That's the song of the rain. They're all neutral, you see. They're all um, wu-ting. They have no ting, right? They're all, life is, you know, happiness and sorrow. Um, um, being together and being apart. These things are all part of the rain song, which is Wu Tin. And so by making, a, by making what seems to us like a mistake, he's actually made a stroke of genius. And by contrast, I give you the translation by, by Mr. D. C. Lau. I think I got his... Oh, here's Arthur Whaley. Sorry, I'm just catching up with my photos. There's Arthur Whaley. There's David Hawkes. Oh, here we are. Here's D.C. Lau. Now, D.C. Lau is very well known in Hong Kong because he's from Hong Kong and he taught at the Chinese University. And his father was a famous Hong Kong poet who actually specialized in writing poetry. But that doesn't mean that D.C. Lau is going to be a good translator. You know, he's a very accurate translator. He was a very sharp... He trained as a philosopher, D.C. Lau, in Glasgow. And he had a very sharp mind, but he wasn't a poet. I knew him very well, actually, and um, he was um, a very, very clever man. But when you look at his translation of this poem, there's no music at all. It's a very, very plain, prosaic translation. And therefore, for me, it fails the very first test, which is, it has no music. And although, that's, although it's uh, poetry is songs without music, if you don't put back some of the music, you have failed. It has to be musical. So, um, the, um, I've taken the liberty of giving you a couple of my own translations of the poems, but I'm not going to read them because I'm too embarrassed 
but one of them is by Qin Guan, and I really like the poem. And I just wrote this for a friend, actually, and I sent it off. And then the other one on pages 11 and 12, I will read to you because I'm particularly happy with this translation. This is a poem by one of the last of the great Su poets, Wang Guowei. And uh, I, I translated it like this. It's to the tune, uh, Dear Lian Hua. And I translated it. By the road stands a mansion a hundred feet high. Light thunder in the sky in the half-light of dusk or dawn. At a balcony alone, a maiden idly counts the tiny passers-by. A momentary shower reveals treetops above the dust of carriage wheels. In mansion and lane, age turns to dust again. Toward evening, west wind blows in the rain. Tomorrow will bring more puddles, more pain. Um, it's one of the few of my translations of so that I'm still, after all these years, relatively happy with. And you see, I use a lot of rhyme, and I try to make it very light, try to make it very, very, very flimsy, very light. Um, well, I don't have a huge amount more to say. I've given you, in the next two pages, some of my some of my rambling thoughts about the art of translation, which I, I encourage you to take home and have a look at. Um, and I want to conclude, I'm very, very fortunate and honored that I can do this. I want to conclude by asking my, my dear friend, uh, Ms. Tang Yun Ha, who is a great opera singer, who has agreed to come here today, and she's going to sing for us. But before she does, and um, have you got her CD up in the control tower? <laughs> we don't have to wait for about half an hour because this is a very great lady and I don't want to keep her waiting. Anyway, prepare the CD and I'll just talk while, you, I'll talk while you're preparing it. Um, this is a very famous poem by Li Qingzhao and it's been translated by many, by many um, translators including, and this is where we come full circle, including by Judith Gautier. She called it Désespoir. Appel, appel, implore, implore, stagne, stagne, rêve, rêve, pleure, pleure, souffre, souffre, toujours, toujours. À peine fait-il chaud que la saison du froid revient. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. That's Judith Gautier in like 1856 translating Li Qingzhao's poem, you know, 160 years ago. And then there's a wonderful translation by a Jesuit priest who lived in Hong Kong called Father John Turner, which is in, in its own way very, very lovely, very peculiar, but very lovely. And it goes on page, on the last page of your handout, page 14. I pine and peek and questless seek, groping and moping to linger and languish, anon to wander and wonder, glare, stare and start, flesh chilled, ghost thrilled with grim dart and keen canker of rankling anguish. Sudden a gleam of fair weather felt, but fled as fast, and the ice-cold season stays. How hard to have these days in rest or respite, peace or truce. Sip upon sip of tasteless wine is of slight use to conquer, to counter or quell the fierce lash of the evening blast. The wild geese, see, fly overhead. Ah, there's the grief that's chief. Grief beyond, here, beyond bearing. Wild fowl, far faring. In days of old you sped, bearing my true love's tender thoughts to me. Lo, how my lawn is rife with golden blooms of bunched chrysanthemums. Weary their heads they bow. Who cares to pluck them now, while I the casement keep? Lone, waiting, waiting for night, and as the shades fall upon broad leaves, sparse raindrops drip. Ah, such a plight of grief, grief unbearable, unthinkable. And then a third and final translation is by Jungling and Kenneth Rexroth, who I talked about earlier. And they call, the, they call this poem Autumn Love. Search, search. Seek, seek. Cold, cold. Clear, clear. Sorrow, sorrow. Pain, 
pain. Hot flashes, sudden chills, stabbing pains, slow agonies. I can find no peace. I drink two cups, then three bowls of clear wine until I can't stand up against a gust of wind. Wild geese fly overhead. They wrench my heart. They were our friends in the old days. Gold chrysanthemums litter the ground, pile up, faded, dead. This season I could not bear to pick them. All alone, motionless at my window, I watch the gathering shadows. Fine rain sifts through the wutung trees and drips drop by drop through the dusk. What can I ever do now? How can I drive off this word? Hopelessness. Now you see, I think all three translations are actually very fine in their different ways. And this, this brings me back to my point, which is that you know, the modernists did not invent Chinese poetry for our time, nor did the romantics, nor did um, Zhong Ling and Kenneth Rector. Actually, the Chinese invented Chinese poetry. Let's not forget that, you know. The Chinese invented it. And we can only do our best to represent it, to perform it for our friends, you know. And each age will have new translations. And some of them will be good. Some of them will have music. Some of them will have feeling. Some of them won't, you know. What can I say? There's no rule. It all depends. I think Zhong Ling and Kenneth Rexroth wrote a very moving translation here, which stems from um, a personal sharing of the emotion of this poem. And um, as I said, music is of the essence. Music is the fundamental of, of the art of poetry. Without music, we have nothing. And each of these three translations, I believe, has some degree of music. Now, I'm very happy to be able to end today's session with some music, because Luckily, this poem of Li Ching Jiao's has been set to music by a contemporary Kun Chu composer. And my dear friend, uh, Miss Tang, is going to perform it for us in order to end today's um, session.
有谁看？则手着窗儿，独自在山岗。黄昏，点点滴滴，点点滴滴，这次。谢谢，谢谢。What can I say? I mean, I feel that's a perfect demonstration of what I've been trying to say all afternoon, which is that um, you know, music is at the heart of poetry. Of course, this is this is a modern country arrangement, right? According to a, a different style of music, but the whole point is that translation is in fact a performance art, just like opera singing. You know, we're trying to perform a translator. If I'm translating this poem of Li Qingzhao's into English. I'm trying to perform that poem in a way that will sing to my English reader, right? And if I use English rhyme or English meter or English music in the words, I'm using an alien, um, I'm using an alien um, style, an alien medium to present, to represent, to perform, to interpret that poem for a new audience, and that's a very wonderful thing to do. That's what keeps alive literature, you know, and it's very important to keep literature alive. I've realised this in the past week, because in my home country of New Zealand, terrible things have happened, and I'm very aware that、um, I'm I'm personally helpless to do much about it. But then I reflect, actually, in order for people to understand each other, and to and to be incapable of behaving so badly to each other, it's very important. That they read things like literature to understand the minds and souls and hearts of other people. So, for example, if if the Western world can read Hong Lao Meng in English, for example, I think they've made one step towards understanding Chinese people, and I believe that very profoundly. If they can read Chinese poetry in English and hear the music of that poetry, they're one step closer to sympathising, to empathising, to understanding. The hearts and minds of Chinese people, and that will bring mutual understanding. And of course, it works the other way as well. If Chinese people can read, you know, Shakespeare in Chinese, they will be able to understand the the hearts and minds of the English people as well. So I think that this kind of performance, whether it's translation or singing, is is of vital importance to our world, and we shouldn't be、um, we shouldn't be ashamed. To be translators, because I think we're doing a very important job. And as I say, with with Chinese poetry, it's a very very hard job, but it's worth persevering. And throughout the ages, there have been some extraordinary stories, like the story of Judith Gautier, which which can inspire us to continue with this task. So thank you very much. If anybody wants to ask me any questions, I'm very happy to, you know, see if I can come up with any answers. But I probably can't, you know. But I'm, I'm more than happy to try.、Mm. So, if we say music is at the heart of poetry translations, and、mm. what would you say is the essence of fiction translation? 
what's at the heart of fiction translation? Oh, thank, thank you, that's a nice question. I have, a, I have a ready-made answer as well, which makes it even better. I think that, I think that the heart of translating fiction is telling a story, you know? Fiction is basically storytelling, you know? Especially Chinese fiction, it's all about, you know, shuo um, shu, it's, it's like, you know, hua um, shuo, you know, it's about telling a story. And Cao Su Tin was a wonderful storyteller, even though there's not a great deal of plot. He keeps you going, you know. He, he's able to tell a story. He's a raconteur, you know. And all the, great, all the great novels of the world tell a story, you know. That's what they are. They're stories. And I think that um, telling a story is an art. You know, they talk about people having the gift of the gab, you know. They know how to tell a story. Some people can tell a story. Some people can't, you know. Some people are very bad at telling a story. You fall asleep in the middle, you know, because they're so boring. But a good storyteller keeps you going, keeps you alive. You know, take, for example, the Hong Kong writer uh, Zhao Liangrong, you know, Jin Yong. I mean, I don't think he was a very great writer, but he was a good storyteller, you know. He knew how to tell a story. He made lots of money out of it. That's what he wanted to do. And he was a very successful writer in terms of his personal wealth. Because he, he could, people wanted to know, they wanted to know what happened next, you know. They couldn't put it down, you know. That's a good storyteller. He was a good storyteller. And when he was a young man, Jin Yong, you know, often said, he said to me personally, I'm just a storyteller, nothing else. I'm just a storyteller. Later on, he started to want to be a great writer, you know, which is, I'm afraid, a big mistake. But, I mean, he was a very good storyteller. And, you know, some of those, um, you know, people like Zhang Hunshui, he was a good storyteller too, you know. The, the, you know, um, in the 1920s, 30s, you know. But, I mean, to be a good storyteller, you know, you, just, you have to know how to tell a story, you know. And um, that's my answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. uh, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Dr. Ten. Dan uh, Yunha mm. mm. Boxy uh, for her really wonderful yes. rendition so of uh, Li Qing Zhao's Song uh, uh, Ma, and that's really wonderful. I've never seen, never heard anything that sounds so high in such a high class style. I think because you know she reminds me of Dan Li Jun. Dan Li Jun, of course, is totally <laughs> different, totally different, totally yeah. different rendition. Dan Li Jun sang some of the Ci. Uh, poetry. Mm. I think they were put to music by Wang Jim, the late oh, yes, Wang Jim. Oh, yes, Wang, yes. You know, mm. was a very mm. wonderful and talented man. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, it's a totally different feeling because Deng Li Jun, you know, because it was uh, supposedly sung by the sing-song girls mm. in this kind of sing-song establishment. Uh, uh, so I guess Deng Li Jun probably was closer to that. But uh, Dr. Tang, uh, Tang Yunha, uh, Boxy, I think uh, rendition is really uh, very high class and it's another feeling, another kind of uh, style. And uh, so thank you, thank you very much on behalf of the School of Translation and also on behalf of the uh, Hengzhen University. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to extend my invitation to ask you to come back maybe <laughs> sometime later and you could uh, sing us more songs, Quan mm. Chu, uh, Jing Chu. Uh, uh, I got a question for you, John, because I think... Uh, Don't uh, ask me to sing, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I would, of course, I would like to thank you as well, but uh, that comes later. <laughs> uh, but uh, two weeks ago, I think you talked about the... Uh, idea of the si, the, the si sheng, and that uh, in modern Mandarin, uh, Putonghua, uh, there's no ru sheng, there's no entering tone, right? So I think this is a very typical example, sheng sheng man, because if you read it, if you try to read it in Cantonese, mm. it's, you know, gives you a, a very wonderful sound, mm. you know, other than just uh, Alliteration. I think uh, I, I'm, I'm not a very good reader. Maybe someone here can help me. But you know, something like "cham uh, cham mek mek lang lang ching ching, chai chai cham cham chik chik, ah, jia lian wan han zi hao zui lan sheng shi." You see, the, the the rhyme actually is in the Ru Sheng Mandarin mm. tone. Mm. So, and it gives us a kind of a because it, you, you cannot say it 
long. You cannot utter the sound. You can you cannot pronounce the word long. You you know chum chum. Make make that's it, right? Ching ching, of course, you know, it's quite different. But it's also a stop as well. So I think that's very very deliberate, deliberate. And I think that you mentioned that you know uh, if you uh, recite Tang poetry or even si, some sometimes. You know, it sounds better when it's read in Cantonese mm, because it mm. has retained some of the older, uh, you know, the very ancient characteristic of the Chinese language. So, mm. so, but if you look at the translation, you look at the translation. I think if you, uh, I think some of the translators actually try to compensate for this kind of a loss. I don't, I don't know whether or not you can reproduce this kind of rule some uh, effect. So we say effect. Because you know, in Chinese, as I said, it's almost like gasping because chum chum make make lan lan ting ting chai chai cham cham tick tick. You know, you're saying something, but then you have to stop. You're saying something, you have to stop, mm. right? Because it's a stop. So, but if you look at John John Turner, uh, John, uh, John Turner, I think uh, he's a wonderful translator. You know, he could be a very faithful translator, and he could render uh, the poems into highly readable. And sometimes wonderful English poems. So, so if you look at it, I pine and peak alliteration, and uh, questless seek, because that's uh, that's rhyme too. And then gasping and moping. Now you know using this kind of same rhythm now mm. in linger and language alliteration again. Mm. So and if you look at Zhong Ling and Kenneth. Rex Ross' uh, mm. uh, rendition is search, search, seek, seek. Uh, cold, cold, clear, clear. Uh, sorrow, sorrow, pain, pain. And you know, they're also using alliteration as well. So they're trying to compensate for this kind of uh, uh, effect. But do you think that's a similar or does it work well in the in English translation? Wow! Um, thank you, Gilbert. You should have given the t lecture instead of me, actually, because you. <laughs> I, think, I think you really hit several nails on the head there, you know, and not the nails of my coffin, I hope. But you know, um, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the whole essence of translation is what I call comparative rhetoric. It's trying to find an equivalent effect of the original, but that equivalent may be far removed. I agree with you, John Turner does a wonderful job here. And what's peculiar is that he was a Jesuit priest, you know. What does he know about sing-song girls? What does he know about love? What does he know about, you know, um, um, the poor wretched um, Li Ching Zhao's poor wretched sorrow? I mean, he's an old Jesuit priest, for goodness sake. And he was, but he was crazy about translating Chinese poetry. He was a real madman. And I think this is a wonderful translation. And I agree with you, he uses all his tools, you know, alliteration and so on and so forth, to try to recreate what he hears as the music of the Chinese. And I also absolutely agree with you about Cantonese. I always used to encourage my students to read poetry in Cantonese, because it always reads better than in this so-called Putonghua, which isn't a real language at all, you know. Putonghua is a kind of invented language, you know. I would, I would prefer them to read poetry in, um, you know, Min Nan Hua even better than 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 Pu Tong Hua. You know, Pu Tong Hua is one of the least musical of all Chinese languages, in my humble opinion. Um, but Cantonese is one of the very best, you know. And I think Cantonese is a very great way of reading Tang poetry, for example. Um, and I think that the art, you know, it, it all connects in a sense to what I was saying about music. You know, the great translators they they hear the music. You know, they Zhi Yin, they hear the sound. And they can hear that sound and they can trans transform it, they can transmute it into another sound which has the same basic musical quality. And that's, that's the sign of a really great translator. I think this example of John Turner's is one of the best things he ever did. It's a very, very strange translation for a Jesuit priest, you know, to get into the mind of a forlorn, uh, forsaken woman, you know, who's mourning, mourning, the passage of love, you know. I mean, but I mean, after all, that's what a lot of true poetry is about. It's about men 
putting themselves into the mindset of a woman and a sing-song house. The sing-song house is the setting for this kind of poetry. You're quite right. And in fact, interestingly enough, was in February last year, well, I invited Dr. Tang to come to New Zealand and we had a wonderful symposium. And in the afternoon, we actually recreated a sing-song house. We gave, a, we gave all of the members of the symposium lots of wine to drink and we invited them into this beautiful mansion and we had various ladies performing on the pipa and the guqin and then, and then Dr. Tang sang for us an aria from the setting of Hong Lai Man, I think, wasn't it? And the atmosphere was exactly like a kind of golo, you know, it was a wonderful atmosphere. I can't do it here unless next year you'd like me to create a kind of golo here. I'm very happy to do that. I could invite some, you know, lovely ladies to come and play musical instruments and we can sing and drink and have fun, you know. This is the atmosphere of, of the Tsu poet. And um, what is remarkable is that Father John Turner, bless his heart, manages to enter into that world through sheer love of poetry, you know. I'm sure he was a very, very pure and upright Catholic priest, you know. But he was a friend of um, John Deeney's, you know, at Chinese University. John Deeney was the one who preserved his translations. It was his personal passion, you know, his passion all his life. It's what he did was translate poetry. And he always had a go at doing it. He had a go at hearing the sound, hearing the music, you know. Uh, the use of rhyme and the root, uh, ru, ru sheng in, in this Tzu poem, I think. Mm. Uh, we could just look at the last line. Jie mm. uh, qi dai yi. Uh, let it go. Zhen yi ge zhou zhi liu duck. Mm. This duck, actually, I think it's really wonderful. You know, because it's, it's really, it's, it's tough. All of a sudden, mm. you know, how can you express this kind of sorrow with one word? Mm. The chou, the sorrow. You see, so, so that's powerful. Very, very powerful. Mm. I, I don't know how it was sung uh, at the time, but I, I think uh, Dr. Tang also uh, rendered it very well. I think mm. she sort of stopped it right before the very last word, right? Last mm. character. Mm. Right? So I think, think that that's also another way of doing it. Uh, and if we look at the translation, because I'm always very interested how you can compensate. I think, I think both the translators actually try to compensate it by using, of course, John Turner uh, got uh, a grief, uh, unbearable, unthinkable. Mm. So, you know, this kind of uh, music there too. But I think he's trying to compensate it by using the meaning of the word. But, you know, with the Chinese, it's liu dang, it's really not, you know, the kind of sor sorrowful kind of word. And you look at uh, Zhong Ling and Kenneth uh, Rexroth, it's just one word, uh, hopelessness. Mm. I think they're trying to, just to compensate it, you know, by the meaning of the word hope, hopelessness. But, mm. uh, uh, you know, it got some music to it, but probably, not as good as John Turner in this particular case, I think, in my personal op opinion. So, you see, so the, both the translators, both of the versions actually are done very well in the sense that they will try to compensate for the loss of the, of the music uh, in the uh, translation, which I think is very, very difficult to reproduce. Mm. So, what do you think? Well, actually, I think the best of all is the very first one by Judith Gauthier, where she simply ends up with the word désespoir, which means despair. But it, it, has, a, it has the word itself, because we're talking about the musical quality of words, right? Chinese, English, French, doesn't really matter which language. We're talking about the musical quality of words. I don't actually think that either Turner or Rex Roth and Zhong Ling, are, the, the, the words are weak, you know. And, and, I mean, unthinkable, un, unbearable. These are rather weak forms of words. They're adjectives for a start. And they're rather sort of little, 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 little. You know, they don't have a force. I mean, you're talking about the force of this duck, you know, which I, I do. I commit, and I don't, I, don't, I don't also think that hopelessness, it's very weak as a word. But in the French, désespoir, you can imagine it. It's a throbbing kind of word, you know. The actual word has a musical quality itself. So we're talking here about the musical quality of language, you know, which is the essence of the whole thing, you know. That's where, you know, Shakespeare was the greatest master of all. 
he couldn't write a line without it being musical. And after Shakespeare, John Keats. You know, Keats was a superb master of the musical quality of words, of words per se, you know, of each individual word. And I personally think that both Turner and Rexroth fall, fall down on the very last word because it's so weak. It kind of tails off into nothing. Whereas in the, in the, in the Chinese, it comes to this intense moment at the end where you feel the desperate loneliness and anguish of this woman, you know. And the French, I think here, Judith Gautier rises way above the others when she just uses that one word, désespoir. Would you agree with me there? Because you see, Dr. Tang speaks very fluent French and was educated in, in, in Geneva and Paris. So I think you would agree with me, désespoir. You can imagine singing that, can't you? You know, très fort, yeah. You see, whereas unthinkable, unbearable, it's, it's a bit like a kind of telephone conversation, you know. It's kind of, it's a bit like a text message, you know. It hasn't, it hasn't got the force, the musical intensity. And I think that you're, 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 you're absolutely on the money here, you know. Well, you would be, because you're an experienced translator. You know what this is all about, you know. We know. We all know. I mean, in our hearts, we all know what has to be done. And we can all recognize success. We know when some, you know, I, my grandmother was from Chile, you know. She was from the South America. She was a Chilean, a Chilean lady called Juanita. And um, my favorite grandmother, she was a lovely lady. She sang, she played the piano, and she was the musical one in my family. And, you know, she would sit in on dinner parties when my father, who was a diplomat, would talk about Marla, Beethoven, blah, blah, blah. And she would just look at me and say, John, some music moves me. She couldn't speak very good English. Some music moves me, you know. And her simple soul went straight to the truth, you know. Some poetry moves me, you know. Why does it move me? Because of the music because of the sheer music of the words, you know. Why does, why does Keats always move me, you know? Because his words are packed full of music, you know, and, and Shakespeare equally, you know. And, and a, great, a great poem is full of music. A great translation is full of music. And that's all I have to say about it, you know. Mm. I completely agree with you, Gilbert. <laughs> we have like minds on this matter, and so do we, right? We know. Mm. I know you're not, you need to leave, don't you? Mm. Uh, hello. Hi, Professor Man. But yeah. uh, talking about the translation of Tzu poetry, mm. uh, for Tzu, we have very different styles, like the Hao Fang Tzu by Su Dongpo mm. and the uh, Wan Yue Tzu represented by maybe Li Qingzhao. Mm. So when we are going to translate these poems, how can we recreate uh, the different styles or the different tone in our translation? Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. I had to deal with this problem, I think it was um, in 1979. My very first um, adventure in translation was, in fact, to translate an essay by a very great critic of Tzu poetry called Miao Yue. And he wrote a thing called Lun Tzu. And he talks about this problem. And I had to translate very different styles of Tzu poem in that essay. And um, I think it's to do, I mean, it's all connected with what we've just been talking about. As a performer, you have to be able to vary your style. You may have, you know, for example, if you're a pianist and you play Chopin, all right, like Fu Lei's son, Fu Tsung, right, he plays Chopin. Some of Chopin is very hao fun, you know, some of his Polonaise, fan fantasy, very, very turbulent, very noisy, very dramatic. And then some of his mazurkas are very delicate and very um, subtle. And a great pianist has to be able to vary his style. And Fu Tsung does. And you know, on the, on the subject of Fu Tsung, the pianist, his father, Fu Le, once wrote to his son, do you know why you understand Chopin's mazurkas so well? It's because you have read Tzu poetry, because you have read Chinese poetry, which is so restrained and understated. And therefore, you're able to play Chopin mazurkas, which are so light, but also so moving, because you understand that kind of art. And you see, any great artist, whether it's a pianist or an opera performer, I mean, you know, for example, my friend Dr. Tang, she has to perform different kinds of roles. She can play a military 
she can play a woman dressed up as a man in military uniform, jumping off tables, you know, and throwing spears and things. Can you imagine this delicate flower pretending to be a, a general, you know? But she has to. That's part of her training. You know? That's part of her gong fu, you know? She was trained to do that. She's not just a kind of a du li niang, you know. She could also be a tough general, you know. That's part of her virtuosity. That's her training. And that's what you have to do. I mean, for example, um, when David Hawkes translated Hong Lo Meng, he sometimes translates very, very sensitive, almost, you know, sentimental scenes involving, you know, Lin Da Yu burying the flowers, for example, or whatever. But then also he translates some very naughty scenes where people are being very sexy and naughty with each other and very funny scenes. So he has to be humorous, he has to be lyrical, he has to be, he has incredible range. You have to have a range, you know. And when, when you translate some of those hao feng, so you have to be able to be more sort of outgoing, you know, like Xin Qi Ji, you know, you have to be able to let go a bit. But if you translate, you know, um, someone like Yen Qi Da, you have to be more sort of contained, you know. It's, a, it's to do with technique. It's to do with um, um, varying your range of expression. And it's something you learn with practice, you know. I think the best statement ever made about Chinese poetry by a non-Chinese person was made by Professor Robert Hightower of Harvard University, who died many years ago. And he said, there's only one way to learn how to read Chinese poetry. Just read more of it. You know? And I absolutely agree with him. Every poem you read, you get better, you know? It's like every, every wine you taste, you get to learn more about tasting wine, you know? And there's all sorts of different kinds of wine. Well, there's white wine, red wine, rosé wine. There's strong wine, there's less intense wine, and so on. The same with reading poetry. You have to learn how to do it by reading more and more of it until you start to feel, you start to feel it in your blood. And then maybe you can start to translate it. And the only way to learn to translate it is to keep translating more and more of it, you know. It's only practice that will improve. And by practice, you have to extend your range. Don't always translate the same kind of thing, you know. Translate different things. Translate something modern, for example. Translate something very old. And um, a translator needs to develop that um, range. Expand their repertoire. And also, very important, they need to never stop enjoying what they do. Because the minute they stop enjoying it, that will communicate itself to your reader. You can tell immediately. I know translators, they're very good on page one. Oh, great. Nice translation. Get to page two. Hey, what's going wrong here? Page three, the guy's completely given up, you know, because he's lost the joy of doing it, you know. He's got bored. Maybe he wants to go off and do something else. Well, go and do something else then. Don't translate, because if you don't enjoy it, you will immediately communicate that to your reader. And enjoying it is to do with getting better at it and getting more pleasure, more satisfaction, and communicating that. It's the same with performing, performing, you know, playing the piano or singing an opera or whatever. The minute you're not actually reveling in what you're doing, the minute you don't feel it into your entire being, your, your, your audience knows it immediately, you know, immediately. Anyway, that's a very long answer to your question, so. I think we probably ought to stop, Orton. we It's getting quite there. There seems to be one more lady with her delicate hand raised in the air. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Mingford. Mm. My question is like, when you are translating ancient Chinese poetry, which kind of words do you prefer to apply? For example, uh, do you prefer to apply those modern uh, English words, or do you prefer to apply those uh, ancient English words. I see, yeah. I think I've understood your question. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think that, I think it's a mixture of the both, a mixture of the two, actually. I think that we, it's no good just using old words just for the sake of using old words, you know. You have to use, you have to be convincing. You have to, you have to have a, a level of speech that is convincing. You can't start mixing old and new. Otherwise, your, your reader will think, what the hell's going on here, you know? Um, it's to do with register, right? I mean, there's a very famous translator of Chinese fiction, whose name I won't mention, who has no idea of register. Switches register from page to page. You've got to have a consistent register. Now, with poetry, you, make a, you can make a choice 
with each line, with each word. And sometimes you may choose a word which is slightly more poetic, you know. You don't, you, you, I would never translate sort of poetry using sort of, you know, rap kind of English, you know. Hey man, I'm just going to go up a hundred. I mean, no, you know, that would be totally inappropriate. But also, I'm not going to use deliberately archaic English because that's not going to be very convincing. I don't have a straightforward answer to your question. It's a question you have to ask each time you do a work, you know. For example, with Hong Ramon, David Hawkes and I, mainly him, had to decide, are we going to use a very old-fashioned way of translating it, or are we going to use a very modern way, or what? Where are we going to pitch it? And he decided he wanted to pitch it somewhere that would be that wouldn't get out of date in 50 years' time. Somewhere that would be a bit timeless, you know, that wouldn't be old-fashioned. It wouldn't be like 19th century Charles Dickens. It wouldn't, but it wouldn't be like, um, you know, um, uh, Graham Greene either. It would be somewhere, somewhere, in fact, probably quite close to someone like Henry James, you know, which is, can still be read today easily, but which is sort of timeless, you know. And that was his choice for Hong Lao Meng. Now, you know, he might have made a quite different choice for, say, Jinping Mei. I don't know, because he never did it, right? But, I mean, each time you make a separate choice. And um, when, I'm, when, when I've translated to the poetry, I've probably only translated about ten in my life, because I find it very, very difficult. And it requires quite a lot of wine and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> And life is short, you know, but I mean, I usually find myself using the kinds of words that seem right. I can't be more, I can't be more precise than that. The words, if, if it's, for example, take a, take a sort of poem by Wei Zhuang, for example, a famous late Tang, uh, uh, early, an early sort of poem. I mean, his, po his sort of poetry is very, very lightweight, you know. The words have to be almost falling through your fingers, you know. You can't use heavy words. And that's not to do with being modern or ancient. It's to do with the intrinsic quality of a word, you know. To go back to Gilbert's, it's to do with the, the sound, the music of the word. And you just have to weigh each word very carefully, you know. And then, you, and over here is your Chinese original, you see. And you listen to that. You listen to the weight of those words. And then you try and get the weight approximately the same. Don't make it too heavy, because that'll, that'll be sacrificing the feeling of the original. So it's, it's all to do with each individual case. You make an individual judgment, and it's to do with the actual quality of the words themselves. I can't answer you more specifically than that, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Hmm. I think we should stop now, because time is getting on, and um, my friend has to go to a, go and teach. <laughs> No peace for the wicked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.